Hello again. All right, so as promised, this is a follow-up video to the introduction I had just given about the new uh, ESP32 controller that is going into the uh, attenuator for the GP Star kit. Uh, pardon my hair, I am in desperate need of a haircut, but I have my full Egon do going right now, so this feels absolutely like the right time to <laughs> to do this. I've been waiting a week for various parts to come in from Amazon, uh, the, not the least of which is, all right, so let's go over the hardware real quick. So this is what I had purchased previously, about 20 bucks gets you a pair of these ESP32 controllers plus a terminal shield. I used the wrong term uh, on the last video. Terminal shield. I love these for prototyping. They're great to make real quick uh, connections and change things up. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solder directly onto a headless ESP32. I've already, uh, this is also purchased as a pair. Uh, it was much cheaper because the headers are not pre-soldered. Uh, think about 14 bucks for a pair of these. So you can see the price difference on, you know, picking up an extra uh, terminal shield versus solderless or unsoldered. Now, these devices have like 30 something pins. It's quite a bit. I think it's 15 pins on each side. Most of those are GPIO, general purpose input output. There's also pins for, uh, see the VN ground, uh, 3VE3 ground. So this is a board that takes five volts in, which is great because the rest of the pack uses uh, five volts, essentially USB uh, regulated current five volts in, but this runs on 3.3 volts, unlike the Arduino, which all of its output pins are at the five volt level. So there are a few differences, most of which has you will not need to worry about uh, in your uh, configuration if you follow the plans that will be published for the, the DIY approach for this. The only thing to know is we're gonna send five volts in, we're gonna get 3.3 volts uh, regulated by this board for the chip. We, we are going to make use of the three volt output, the 3V3 pin for some of our accessories. And despite it having so many pins available, uh, if you see this rat's nest here, not every pin is going to be used. And that's because when you take the range of total pins available and you take things off like some, if they're set high or low, will affect the boot sequence. Some are dedicated to the onboard flash storage. When you use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, the uh, additional pins are used. So it really starts to narrow down the number of pins that are truly available for use on this board. And the good news is we have just enough to make this work. We've got several inputs. We have toggle switches. We have the rotary encoder, which needs to detect turning one way versus the other. So that's two pins. It has a center post push. That's another pin. Uh, we have the uh, bar graph, which is gonna need two data pins, the uh, I2C bus, as it's called. We're gonna need two pins for transmit and receive back to the pack, so that's that's two pins there. Uh, you can see where this is going. We're, we, we very quickly whittle down the number of av available pins. Oh yeah, the, um, the piezo buzzer, the uh, vibration motor. Again, everything starts whittling down and we have to get creative. Uh, namely on this board, there, some of these pins are input only. They're labeled as GPIO for input output, but they're really input only. Uh, the other wrinkle that we have is that some of the pins that we need to utilize do not have what's called a pull-up resistor. And that is necessary because essentially these toggle switches, let's take these for an example. On the Arduino, there's a built-in pull-up resistor and think of it like a spring. It's either gonna pull it high or pull it low by default. And when you flip the switch, in this case, I'm gonna connect the pin to ground. So as soon as I pull it to ground, that means I'm gonna pull the pin low. Now I know the state is low. If I flip it back the other way and it's no longer attached to ground, where does it go? That's where you need the pull-up resistor. So there is a little PCB that I've made 
uh, this is all documented, and this might be one of the things that we'll have to uh, build out as a as as a kit component. But this is basically how we started with the uh, with the rest of the GP Star hardware. Michael had come up with here's the resistors and the transistors needed for making this work. We breadboarded it. We're able to confirm that it worked. This is a uh, semi-permanent, you know, everything's soldered down. Uh, once we were able to confirm that it worked, we can document it. And once we document it, that means we can start designing other components around it. All right, all that to say, there are a few items that will be needed, uh, namely resistors. There are certain values that will work. Uh, this is going to, it's a jumble of wires here, but we're going to get a uh, three volt uh, supply from that 3V3 pin on the uh, ESP. That's going to provide us voltage. We're going to knock that down with the resistors so they're at a safe working level uh, for these pins. And we're going to attach to the toggles and we're going to attach to the data lines on this bar graph. Right now, this is the Fruto bar graph. It does not have any uh, built-in pull-up resistors, and that's because the Arduino and the, the AT Mega chip that's been used already has those, so it wasn't necessary. I uh, Already talking with uh, Fruto Technology, they may redesign this board with some built-in resistors that will uh, deal with that automatically. That'd be great, but that's a future enhancement. So for right now, I'm dealing with the um, uh, getting this to work with the component as is. <sighs> so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to uh, mm -hmm -hmm. I'm going to basically take this thing apart, and we're going to transfer some of the components over pin by pin to this board. I have already flashed this on uh, via my computer using the Arduino IDE. I have confirmed that the Wi-Fi works. The software appears to have loaded just fine. I can get into it uh, via the, the Wi-Fi. As far as I can tell, this chip is completely compatible. Uh, it is labeled as a ESP WROOM32, so an ESP Room32. Now let's talk briefly about the casings. So, uh, all right, here's the, here's the prototype that I had built. This is based on Shape Forge Props design, which was based on Adam Savage's design. I wanted to make sure that is clear. Uh, yes, this is this is my take on it. The dimensions may not be 100% to either one of those designs, but it does borrow heavily from what uh, Shape Forge Props did, and that was Adam Savage had used uh, rivets, and I think he may have actually used bent sheet metal uh, on his design and then he used rivets to connect everything together. Or more precisely, I think that was uh, Ben Eady that was helping him with it. So Ben Eady did the uh, case design based on Adam's advisement. And so that was Adam's design. I really like this shell uh, design. It makes it really easy. I just have some blank holes in here and you just add some little uh, three millimeter uh, socket head screws and everything's good. The uh, dial on top is just a 3D printed knob. This was a combination of a couple, it was a remix of a couple designs in uh, Thingiverse. Same thing with this. Uh, part of it was uh, 3D designed by me, the inner lens, and then the external was basically a mashup of a couple different uh, other designs. Internally, I have some little clips that I'm gonna use with some CA glue. These are going to surround my little LEDs and help hold them tight where I need them. Uh, instead of a 3D printed lens on the front, I've actually found this on DigiKey. It is a it is a nice clear dome. It it amplifies the light. It is going to be very bright. Uh, I kind of like this. It looks a little more professional than the 3D printed one. So I've got this for the front and underneath it to help diffuse because it is bright, I had made this little tiny cap that fits perfectly over uh, these pixels. This is, and that's the, that's the finished, that's the finished design right there. So the LED is on the back side. It's super glued in already, has the little diffuser dome, 
and then this thing fits right on top. So that will be the new front lens and it'll be nice and diffused when you see it all lit up. So yeah, lots of, lots of design changes, including this one. There is one key difference. This is the new design. Uh, this was printed in aluminum. I added this after, fa after the fact. I drilled into the casing. Really wasn't that hard. Aluminum is a relatively soft metal, and as long as you go slow, you don't risk uh, cracking the structure. This thing is pretty solid. You can see I've got these little angle pieces in the corner. They have been tapped. I used a uh, tap, uh, a screw thread tap, hollowed these out basically for an M5 screw. So this, this has a nice positive grip and that will hold the back plate on. And then once that's on the pack and this is all ready to go, the two mate and you just put four screws in the corners and you're done. So back to this light real quick, I had a spare clip light. So this uh, looks the part because this is what I used in a different 80% uh, uh, Neutrona wand for the slow blow light. So it is reminiscent of the other lights you've seen on the pack. It could be a larger uh, clip light if you want. I've already updated the design. So when we do get to the point of uh, building out any kits and printing any of these shells, this hole will already be here. If you want to widen it to fit a larger clip light, you can. This is perfectly perfectly the right size for these tiny little LEDs to shine behind it. It is very bright. And yeah, what this is going to do is this is going to give some additional feedback that you can actually see when you are looking down. You'll be able to see it out of the corner of your eye if you look down at your pack. What this will do is there'll be blink patterns that will indicate the menu level that you're at. So you'll know whether you're on the main level, uh, level one, which controls the master volume and starting and stopping music, or if you're on the sub-level, which is affecting the volume uh, and the track navigation. That was one thing that, despite the other interface uh, or other feedback with the buzzer and the uh, vibration, I would mentally lose track of which menu I was on, and I was constantly turning the dial and wondering why isn't the volume, oh, I'm on the effects volume. So this will now have a blinking pattern that will indicate which menu you're at. It'll also have a light pattern. So when we do get to a point where we have additional devices connected, you will know that the devices are connected uh, because it will change colors. And so that will, that'll give a good indication of everything working as expected. And so this, I think, is going to be a worthwhile inclusion. Everything I say is, is leading up to something or other. Uh, and the reason why I mentioned this uh, top light is because we're now up to three LEDs, three NeoPixels on this design. And I think this is probably the, hopefully the max that we need. So we've got the lower indicator, the upper indicator, and the top indicator. Uh, if you followed the, if you followed the last guide, the last version of the DIY guide, there was only two LEDs, the top, the upper and the lower. This adds on to the bottom of the chain. So basically if, if this was your chain of LEDs before, what you'll do is you'll disconnect this from the Arduino Nano. You'll solder on an additional pixel. You'll make sure that you have your resistor on the data line, and then you'll just add some extension wires for the power and data off of the uh, data input portion of the LED and you'll be good to go. So that should make it an easy upgrade. And then you could very easily uh, drill your hole in the top of your, your case. Uh, let's see, what else? I think that's, I think that's about it for the, the changes. Everything else is exactly the same. We've got the same uh, boot. Yeah, and we, we've got a perfect fit. Um, for the most part, the the aluminum enclosure uh, has matched up perfectly with the plastic. There's only slight variations for these holes in the back uh, to make them easier to tap with a uh, thread tap. And this should work. We should be able to let's make sure we'll put the little plastic nut on the inside. We'll screw it in. Yep, we are 
just about flush. So there, there's your exit port. And we're gonna get into all this. My, my plan is to go through everything, including the cable that's gonna go between the attenuator and the pack. We're gonna, we're gonna go through building out all of those components. Sorry, my workbench here is an absolute mess at the moment. And it's trash. Um, yeah. So like I said, what, what I want to do is I want to take the parts that are currently uh, screwed to the terminal block and I want to solder them on to this board. And then once they are soldered on, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hook it up to my test rig, make sure everything works, and then we will put the parts into the shell. So let's talk a little bit about tools because I don't know if I've ever gone into this with my other videos. This is a USB powered, actually it's uh, it could be powered by a 12 volt input or USB-C. I've got a simple little brick plugged into my power strip here. And this thing runs uh, about 120 bucks. It is absolutely one of the best tools I have ever invested in since I started doing more electronics work. I used to have your typical Weller uh, soldering iron, you sit you sit there and wait forever for it to heat up. This thing's already up to temperature. It would go even faster if I plugged it into the 12 volt outlet, but I like having the USB, that way it's nice and portable. Uh, I can take this with me, I don't have to look for a uh, long extension cord. I've got a pretty long uh, silicone covered, so it's very flexible, it doesn't get in the way and it sort of, it allows me to let it rest. So we're gonna move, I think we're gonna move the LEDs first. And these are on pin D23. Let me get my little screwdriver here. Okay, if you haven't gotten some of this stuff, these are boxes of hookup wire. I have a 22 gauge. It's a relatively thicker wire. I like this for when I have a lot of power distribution or I need to put this in a space where I know it might things might be moved around a good bit. Nice thick wire, it's not likely to break. Uh, this too, this is 28 gauge. You can see it's a lot thinner. I like this in tight spaces where I need to, I know that I'm gonna be repositioning things. These are all silicone coated. You see these are very flexible. So it makes it easier to, to sort of coil them up and do your wire management. Uh, inside of whatever device you're connecting to. All right, so I need to do a couple couple of housekeeping items first. I've disconnected my chain of LEDs, and what I need to do is I have a small resistor in here. Basically, the reason for this is you don't want your your uh, microcontroller chip to think that it should send that it should use this for its ground connection. So putting a small resistor on here ensures that electricity is always gonna take the path of least resistance. And so it's going to send all the ground back using this intended ground wire, not the signal wire. So that's the reason why we have a little uh, LED, or little well, LED, we have a small resistor in there. I'd pre-tin these wires so they have some uh, bits on the end I need to get rid of. And I'm going to just gently pull the end of the wire using my snips. And we are going to push up from below. And I'm gonna bend it over the side. just so it stays put. And that is pin D23. That's the one that I selected for the NeoPixels. I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna strip back. So this device, these addressable LEDs require five volts. So when we get to the point of connecting everything, we are going to need higher voltage than what comes out of this. I can't reuse the, I can't use the three volt pin on here to drive these LEDs. It has to come from the five volts that comes from the pack. So we will tap directly into that. We don't wanna give too much heat. So this is up to 320 degrees Celsius. So it is quite hot. There we go. 
and that's it. And I can snip off that little bit of excess and now pin 23 is done. That's all we needed to do. Um, what I do wanna do is I want a little bit of length for power connections. And the reason why I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna pigtail these together once they are connected. So I only want one wire going into the controller, uh, one wire per pin, I should say, because these are relatively tiny holes. Um, and that's the other reason why I like using uh, thinner gauge wires. That's because they will absolutely positively fit through the tiny little holes. All right, so this is going into the ground. When it comes to setting up uh, power input, I like having, I like using the adjoining pins for power to the same area. What I mean by that is I'm gonna use the ground that's right next to the to the VN, which is the five volts input. And when I need the three volt output, I'll use the ground next to that one. All right. Don't wanna over solder because we don't wanna heat things up too much, but we got a nice positive connection there. The trick is don't use too much solder. You just need to touch. You just need to touch to the end there. Let's see if we can get it to Ah, sorry. Get it to focus, maybe? No, okay. But you could see that, hopefully. The uh, five volts, there's our input. Little solder came out the backside, that's perfectly fine. There we go, so we've got power coming in and we've got our LEDs attached. Next thing I need to do is I'm gonna strip the other end. Remember I said I'm gonna pigtail these and that means I'm going to tie multiple, multiple things together. And what am I gonna to tie together? Well, I had made a little shim using two different JST connectors. So this was just, pardon, that looks, that's a big globby mess on the back. I, I apologize for poor soldering, that was, uh, me just being impatient. The idea here is that I have, I've got power, I'm gonna have power coming in via a JST plug. Uh, we'll see that when we get to adding the wire from the pack. Down here, this little JST. So I've got the orientation correct. If you're looking at this with the, uh, and do it like that. When you're looking at it like that, positive should be to the left, negative to the right, and I just follow that all the way through. And that also matches up to what the bar graph expects. So I'll have power coming in, bar graph coming out, and then this will go to my controller and my LEDs. All right, so like I said, we need to we need to combine everything together. We need power at five volts. So we're gonna have five volts coming in from this little breakout. And that's going to be combined or split going to the LEDs. And we're gonna get five volts going into, into, this, uh, into this board. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the ground connection. So we want the ground so we're gonna put all these together, twist them up. Now, one other thing we could do here, this is optional. I've not had any problems without it, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a capacitor. In fact, um, uh, after thinking about this, I've got five volts coming in that needs to run the, the bar graph, three LEDs, and the microcontroller. So I am going to go with a 330 microfarad rated 25 volt, uh, we're only dealing with five volts here. And there is a polarity stripe, so that, that stripe means negative. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap, I'm gonna wrap my wire around the legs of this capacitor. I'll show this in just a second. 
And when I say the wire, this is the, the positive and the negative that is coming in from the pack at five volts. I wanna make sure that I have enough, I, I wanna have a little reservoir of power that will help with any spikes in demand, like suddenly having to light all of the LEDs at once. So all I've done is just wrapped the positive and negative around the respective legs of the capacitor. And I'm going to warm up my, warm up my soldering iron once again, after we get this guy in here. This will handle, uh, like I said, cases where we need an extra boost of power because we're lighting all elements of the bar graph or all of the LEDs at once or the board just needs a little extra uh, boost. Soldering wires is pretty easy. Need just enough to heat up the, the wires and just let the solder flow onto them. That's enough, I don't wanna overdo it because I don't wanna damage the capacitor. Remember, whenever you're heating something up with a soldering iron, you're not just heating the joint, you're heating the whole wire. So whatever the components or whatever's attached to that, uh, you can potentially cause damage if you linger for too long. So we're going to try to not do that. And now that we've got that done, I wanna protect these, protect these joints. So I'm going to put a little bit of heat shrink tubing on here. So I'm gonna find the right size, the right thickness. That seems about right. And I'll snip off what I don't need. Because this is voltage going in, I don't want anything to accidentally short across these posts. So I'm just going to wrap them with a little bit of heat shrink tubing and we're gonna shrink them down. For items like this that stick out a good bit, I don't mind using open flame. I'll probably later, there's gonna be areas where I'm gonna be much tighter tolerances and I don't want to damage components with open flame, I will use a uh, mini heat gun, but just to get this done. So there we go, there's our power coming in. So we've got our little shim, which will make sure that we've got uh, power available to the uh, bar graph. And we've got our little cap here for the LEDs and the the LEDs and the controller itself. Hopefully all that will work as expected. All right, so now we start getting into a few more, uh, we need a few more components here. So let's do, D4 is gonna be the pin used for the rotary encoder's center push. And once I have pin D4 soldered, I'm gonna put a little JST plug on this sucker and that will let me that'll let me connect a JST connection right into the board. It'll make it'll make hookup a little easier later, I think. Cuz remember, I want to be able to test this with the rig first before I connect it to my pack and this will be the easiest way possible. All right, so with that done, and make sure I get the right orientation here. Okay, that's on there. All right, that gives me an easy way to plug in my serial connection directly to the board. All right, so my next pins that I'm gonna do are D32 and D33. D32 is one of my rotary encoder pins. Push that one through, bend the wire over so I know that it's locked into place. And we're gonna unscrew D33. 
Okay, D33 and D32 are done. And we're slowly getting into the rest of the components here. I think what I'll do is I want to free this board entirely. And since I've technically taken care of the TX2 and RX2 connections, we're going to pull those off. I'm going to remove that from the board. Uh, let's see, what else we got? We've got, let's do, let's move D18, which is, which is the piezo buzzer. All right, D18, yeah, I'm still working on this side of the board, or this side is accessible. We'll do that one. Uh, I think I'm going to need to disconnect my bar graph. All right, bar graph's disconnected. That makes this a little easier. Let's do this. D34, I think, we'll do next. This is one of our uh, toggles. All right, D34. All right, and then next is D35. That's our other toggle. All right, so this is D35. All right, D35 is done. Let's do D19. D19 is for our vibration motor. All right. Whew. All right, D21 is the next. That is one of our uh, I2C bus lines. This is what's gonna run the bar graph. So D21. All right, and then D22, which is just a little higher up. That's the other part of our I2C bus for the bar graph. All right, D22 and D21 for our SDA and SCL lines. Those are done. Uh, what else we got? We've got, we need three volt power. So I've been saving this line that goes to my little breakout board here. All right, so we've got our three volt. All right, so we've added three volts and we need our common ground. I'm going to add a little pigtail. So I'm gonna have a ground wire come through and then I will tie that into all the other grounds all right, so for my little breakout board, I already had wires with anticipation of using them for power and ground, so I'm just connecting those. And then on the board itself, I will add any of the ground connections that I need. All right, so now the breakout board is connected to the controller board, and I need to just make a few small modifications here, and that is some of my ground connections need to come into this board. And I've actually got a space on here where I can add several, a uh, whole set of uh, negative lines. So the first thing, I'm gonna tie these two together. These are negative lines for the rotary encoder and the um, push button on top of the encoder. So I wanna push those, I wanna get these through. If you don't have a pair of these helping hands, I've used some two-arm ones before. The four-arm version, so much easier to work with. So worth it. Uh, and then lastly, I need a negative for my, I need a negative going to my buzzer. Ugh, this is a big globby mess back here. Please do not follow me as an example of how to properly solder things. I'm decent, but apparently sloppy. All right, and with that, I have freed up my board. Uh, so this one's good for other prototyping. Everything is now attached onto this controller, which is a flipping mess, but we're gonna solve that or make that a little better. All right, so I'm gonna plug into the TX2 RX2 expansion port. I'm going to plug this into my new TX RX 
connection on my board. We're gonna slide this guy out of the way, right where I ended up putting the other board. All right, and then we need power to this. So we're gonna have power coming in to this little pigtail. Uh, we're gonna need power to the to the bar graph. All right, and then we need, where's our I2C connection? Ah, right, that is on this little breakout board that I created, so there's, so that's a spot for that. And let's see if we can get this untangled a wee bit. We've got our toggles and our rotary encoder. Whew, all right, that is, I think that's everything. Now for the moment of truth, we fire up the battery pack and we see if this stuff actually works. Okay, good news. So these are connect, so it looks like we're working. So all of our LEDs here work. Yep, and we've got the wand and the bar graph for the attenuator are working. So I can change the power level and those change. So that's good. Uh, so our capacitor looks good. Uh, let's see. Yep, if I flip this switch, the LEDs turn on and off. That's good. If I flip that, that is pack on. And if I flip it back, Yep, everything just shut down. Uh, last thing to test is, let's fire up the wand again. We will go into our various modes. So we've got proton, slime, stasis, meson, vent mode. Okay. We've got buzzing and we got vibration. We are good to go. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick break. You won't see that. But when I come back, we are done with soldering the components on here. We are going to get everything into the chassis. So that's the next step is getting everything in here. And then we will talk about how to connect that to the pack. All right, so I made a small mistake, but that's fine, we can recover from it. Basically, I forgot that I need to feed the LEDs through the outside of this enclosure because I had already done all of the decorating and glued this piece in place and I can't otherwise get them in uh, inside of the enclosure. And once they're inside the enclosure, they're actually just gonna show from the backside of, uh, backside of these areas, so. This one's gonna go up through here. I need to correct this, and I think this is probably a good chance to show how to fix a screw up like this and how to do a splice connection. Here we go. I'm going to snip. Uh, power is turned off, by the way, uh, before I short these out by snipping through. I could also just say, let's just snip through each one individually. Uh, this one's gonna be tight. Um, so let this be a lesson. Uh, if you're going to connect all the LEDs, don't do decorations on them first. Get everything connected, get it soldered, make sure it works. Then you can start stuffing it into the enclosure, but only after you have verified that everything is working. I'm trying to cut away some of the old heat shrink tubing, just so I've got a little bit of wire to connect back to. All right, so that's just enough. It's just on the other edge of the resistor. All right, so I have freed these up. So now let's do this, what I should have done to begin with, and that's feed everything through, because all these LEDs will fit. The holes are quite large. They will go through just fine. So now with this one now on the outside, I've got room to run the wires around and have this one show at the upper area. 
and then I'll be able to put a small loop in and have this one shine through the top. All right, we're gonna use hot glue for those, uh, maybe some super glue on the outside. But again, I wanna connect everything, make sure it works, then I will, I, I will cement everything in place. But uh, I don't want there to be an issue or realize that I screwed up some wiring and then have to break apart a super glue seam because that is, that is horrible to have to do that. All right, so I'm going to just, I'm gonna do this the easy way for the positive and negative connections. There's two ways that you can do a splice. One way is you take the wires and you sort of just loop them around each other. One way is you basically cross them and make them hook like that. The other way is you just sort of spiral them together and they're almost straight. Uh, but first you need to remember to slide some uh, heat shrink tubing over one end so that after you get them connected, you slide the heat shrink tubing back, heat it up, and then it's a solid uh, connection. This is, I'm gonna do this the, the, the lazy way, and that is, oh, where's my other end? Oh, there it is. I'm gonna do this lazy way, and that's, I'm gonna just put them together, twist them, and then cover them. And the reason why I'm gonna do that is I am not, I'm not fighting for space constraints here. And what I mean by that is I don't, the length of wire that I have available is more than enough uh, to account for this. So I'm just gonna twist these together and I will, yeah. let's warm up the soldering iron again. Cause you absolutely want your connections to be solid. So anytime you have to splice wires together, you should solder them and then you should cover them with heat shrink tubing just to make sure everything is good and solid. This is where the data wire here, this is the one that will need um, to be a straight line splice. So let me try to show that. So I've got some, there we go. I've got a nice little scrap here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slide this over the longer end of the wire. So, and I'm gonna push it down out of the way. And then what I'm going to do here is pop that through. All right, so these two wires, let's see if we can change that a little bit. All right, so these here, see I'm gonna fold this over and just twist it around. All right, so you see the wires, pretty much straight. It's barely hanging on, but that's fine. We're going to let the we're going to let the solder keep this thing uh, connected. All right, we're up to 320 Celsius and where's my solder and we're going to get these reconnected. So, all I have to do is heat this from below. I just need to get the soldering iron in contact with the metal. And it'll heat up pretty quick. There you go. And then the solder flows and we're good. All right. Wires like this are actually pretty easy to do. That's still hot. All right, so we've got these reconnected. And what I'm going to do is bring this piece back up to protect the splice that I just made. I'm gonna get my other wires hopefully out of the way. What did I just say, out of the way? All right. The trick here is keep the heat moving. Do not, do not linger in one spot too long. All right, that's good. Uh, I've got some, I like my color coding. So I'm gonna take these two for red and black. And we're just gonna put a little bit over the end. Uh, I don't have to have all of this wire protruding. So I'm gonna snip the ends. All right, and get my color coded stuff going here.
give my fingers a little bit of breathing room. And that's done. And where's my other? There it is right here. Notice with the sheathing or with the uh, heat shrink tubing, I'm covering a little bit of the wire as well, not just the solder joint. And that's so that it grips onto the wires. And there we go. And the top's gonna shrink a little more than the rest. Actually, where I really want it is around the wires. I wanna make sure that those wires are held tight because the solder joint's fine. I just don't want these getting pulled apart and then rip that solder joint. Now, let's make sure that everything works. Power up. All right. Yeah, we're good. All of our LEDs are running. Uh, we've got the bar graph responding. Everything's working as expected. I got all the animations I expect. Um, oh, other things I can test. That's the uh, ribbon cable alarm. So I've got a quick little toggle here. I can just confirm that if you were to remove the cable, uh, the ribbon cable, the alarm would go off. And that also applies if you're in the middle of firing. All right, so I think we're good. Uh, uh, Took a quick break to grab some lunch, waited for the uh, CA glue to dry. Basically glued in the flange that holds the lower LED. It's open, it's just large enough to fit everything on the inside. I'm still gonna put some hot glue on that because I don't want the wires to get accidentally pulled free. And that'll make sure everything's also insulated from the metal that's around it. Though everything is painted, there shouldn't be any bare um, metal for it to interfere. This is a quick fitment of what the dome will look like. So it's, this one's clear. Uh, just chatting with someone from the community who found some uh, fluted and frosted versions. So I think this would be this part here. This this is uh, the one part I printed myself. So this I sent off, uh, received this from overseas. This I printed myself, painted it. I'll still probably do a little more weathering before all said and done, but I'm pretty happy with the way this one fits. It's even got the little keyholes to perfectly fit this and I'll, I'll glue that in place uh, as a final step. What I want to do now is, like I said, with the with the hot glue gun, I've got these, and I drop it immediately. I've got these little clips that I printed myself, and these are just large enough that the LED should snap right into. So this one fits pretty much, that's meant to go flush. And the reason why it's a little larger is because it's gonna sit right here and I'm gonna glue it in. But first, let's get these let's get these guys clipped in. This one's a little different. Like I said, this this clip light at the top, I'm going to recommend it, but you don't have to use it. Uh, if you have a larger clip light, all you have to do is round out, uh, drill out the hole a little more. But this little part is meant to fit directly over the back side of that lens, and it stays put, and it will ensure that the light shines directly into the back side of that clip light. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on the power just so that all the lights come on. And yeah, I just wanna make sure that if I bump or nudge something and suddenly it stops working, I can fix it before I've permanently adhered it into place. So like I said, this is gonna get a little hot glue on the back side of the metal. Not so much to keep it in place. The front dome, this is all this is all glued together already. I just want to make sure everything stays put and the wires don't get accidentally pulled. 
And I'm gonna put a little on the back side here for sort of the same reason. I just wanna secure those uh, wires in place. By the way, the uh, the current weight of this, the, the new attenuator that's printed in metal uh, with most of the components uh, I set on the scale, it's around a half pound. So it's it's not as bad as I thought it would be, but it is still it, it is still more weight that you're putting onto the pack and uh, on your shoulder. So at least you're not wearing it on the back. Maybe that's a maybe that's a bonus. Putting just a nice little blob on the back here. This is starting to turn opaque, so it's cooling off. This one's still not surprisingly. I would have thought the glob of hot glue put directly on the piece that's touching the cold metal would have cooled off first, but nope. Yeah, the last one, the prototype, was definitely a rush job. I didn't put quite as much care into it. Uh, there's some rough edges. There's a lot of print lines still visible on it. It is what it is. Um, definitely a proof of concept device. This one's going to be a lot more polished, and this is going to be more in tune with what I envisioned from the start, though not metal. That that was uh, that was not expected, but I'm actually kind of glad I got talked into considering it, because I really kind of like the look. All right. Almost almost opaque. I just, I don't want the glue shifting. I'm trying to do a little bit of wire management while I'm here. So I'm gluing, I'm just gluing this flat in there. I'm trying to keep the wires pressed down because uh, the more I can get those out of the way, the better. And I did kind of do some of this in reverse. There's some weathering and um, accessories on the outside that I already finished. I'll still go over this once everything's installed and I'll do some touch up with paint uh, just to make everything blend together. So basically I'll put some dirt and I'll use rub and buff on some of these. Like I haven't, I haven't done any weathering on the lens, but I'll do that after the fact because I think that way it'll blend wherever I um, do the weathering on the lens, it'll blend if I overshoot and hit some of the uh, metal on the attenuator casing. <sighs> All right, we're getting there. We're getting there. All right, so let's look here. We've got, I think this one, I'm going to use some super glue. Oh, geez. These are bright. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to kill that light so I can actually see. Now, I made this big enough that I should be able to put just a little bit around the outside edge. And there you go. It's, I'm just centering it in that little hole. There we go. So, you can see on the camera, it's, it's pretty bright with a bare lens. That's why I've got the little diffuser dome on here, and there's a uh, diffuser built into the back of this one. So, when you're looking at the... Basically, it's a 3D printed part that has a very tight tolerance and just press fits right into the back of that. Now's the part that I knew was going to be a bit of a pain, and that's I want to... You can see that shining through now, the clip light. I should have enough room. It's not interfering with the screw hole that's here. So let's do the same thing. We're going to put a bit of CA glue on here. And if anybody's curious what I'm using, this is a GH1200. I've actually gotten quite a few of these mini tubes. Uh, so first of all, with CA glue, if you don't use all of it, you end up with an air gap inside of the, the bottle or whatever dispenser holds the glue. That can, as the as the air gap continues to increase, it'll basically dry out the glue, and 
CA glue is very sensitive to moisture, so also depending on where you are, what's your humidity, uh, how well you control the humidity, that's gonna affect how long the glue lasts. What I found is these don't let any air in. As you squeeze them, glue comes out, nothing else goes in. Of all the types I've used, this one, this one seems to do pretty good. I've not had problems with the, the cap getting glued stuck or glued shut on like I have on some cheaper ones. So you can get a pack of these on Amazon and I think they're definitely worth it. Yeah, this one's, I don't think it's sitting quite flat and so it doesn't wanna stay put. Let's see if I can do this without hot gluing my finger. I'm just gonna put a big old blob of it at the bottom here, or since this thing's gonna be hanging, this one in particular is essentially gonna be hanging in upside down. I just wanna make sure that it is on there good. This will move a little quicker once we get done with all the glue parts. And the nice thing is I'm not getting any bleed through, it appears, on the light. So that looks like it's a pretty tight fit. It's flush. All right, so well, I have the bar graph ramping. I know the orientation, so I'm gonna push this guy into place. Actually, before I do that, let me, I'm gonna cut the power. All right, cut the power, because what I wanna do is I wanna snip just the very tops. Safety squints engaged. I just wanted to clip the very tops of those posts just so I know that I've got plenty of room when I push this thing in that the posts aren't going to somehow come in contact with the metal. It's not a problem I would have with the plastic shell, but I just want to be absolutely certain I'm not causing any problems with uh, this metal uh, aluminum one. I know I've done this before. It's not wanting to go in. So what have I done? Oh, you know what I did? I painted it. That's that's what's different now versus the first time I tried to fit this. This actually raises a good point of what to do when things don't fit. And that's needle files. These are incredibly useful. And all I'm doing is just on the inside edge, yeah, I've got a little paint that is causing a fitment issue, mostly at the bottom. So I'm just trying to scrape away some of the paint that ended up here on the sides. When I say this is printed to tolerances, uh, we really did print the tolerances on this. It's a snug fit. You can you can always file it down. I just figured it'd be a bigger issue if there was a huge gap. It'd be harder to uh, harder to accommodate that. All right, so let's try this again. There we go. Much better. Ooh, that that looks pretty good. Go full power. Yeah, we're getting there. And just to make sure everything stays put, more hot glue. So we're doing pretty good. All right, I think it's time to start getting some of these uh, bolt-in components done. So let me get the... Okay, now we're going to start with the bolt-in components. So we've got the rotary encoder on the front edge. And I'm gonna use my vice grip pliers to really get a grip on this thing. You can use any pliers you want. Needle nose are probably gonna be best reason why I use the vice grips are 
they're really gonna ensure that I got a good hold on this nut because I wanna turn this sucker and really clamp down. And there's not a lot of room here. That nut is just barely clearing the thread and that's pretty much by design. There's a little, little block in here, uh, an inset just to make sure that this thing sits far enough back so when I put the dial on top, which has clearance for that nut. Okay, that is. Yep, there we go. All right. Looking pretty good. All right. So next, let's get the toggles. Now I do have a right and a left on these. And just to be certain, the right toggle, when you're looking at it, should turn off the lights, and it does. So we will work on that one first. And these are a little closer to what Adam Savage used. I just checked his um, designs, and he definitely had used the... Um, on the outside, I don't want to see all of these things like the uh, lock washer. So I'm going to stack them on the inside because they should still fulfill their duty, which is the lock washer will help bite into the backs of the metal on the back side. Oh, and this is a very thin nut compared to the other one I just used. Um, what I'm trying to do is I want to tighten this, but I'm trying to make sure I do not scrape the pliers across the metal. Since I've already done the weathering, I don't want those extra tooling marks, but that did work out just right. You see the, um, the weathering just below where the nut, where the nut is. Oh, that's satisfying. I really like that flat paddle style. That feels a little, a little better. And that's the thing. This is all, this is my preference. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll start with a bill of materials. We'll, we'll have all the parts listed. And if you want to build this yourself, yeah, go right ahead. Um, we'll tell you all of the stuff that you need to do it. And then we'll decide what makes sense uh, in terms of, kits because when it comes to kits if you're not doing it yourself you're going to want some of these which are pre-made and that be that might be one of the parts that we uh, decide to use just to make our lives easier so if you want the kit you'll you'll use what we send you if you want to do your own thing nothing's stopping you I think this is going to be like the, the DIY instructions for the the pack and the wand initially. You're free to build it however you want. We're just going to tell you where everything goes. Okay. There we go. And then flip that down, and then the pack comes on. Flip that down, and the lights come on. Pack off lights off and when the lights are off it also kills the um <sighs> it kills the buzzer and the vibration as well all right so if we there we go yeah, we're getting closer uh i think the next is i want to put the rad lens on top so that just fits right over top because that is a lot better once it's diffused. Holy moly. Yeah, I can see what's going to happen is when I put this on, a little bit's going to ooze out underneath, just unavoidable. But what that might give me is a little bit of something to add some paint to. And we'll fix it with weathering. So if we squeeze out a little too much glue on the body of the attenuator, not a big deal. 
Now, I do want to make sure that I get the orientation correct, and that is the two, two prongs at the top. And I want to try to get this lined up so that the LED is dead center underneath. And yeah, I know there's probably a million ways to do this. Uh, my, my goal when I made the shell was everything flat, and that makes it really easy to sand it especially the uh, metal uh, print, the texture on the, on the aluminum, it's not, it's not like rough. Here's a, here's a version I print, had printed also in nylon, but I made a mistake. I used the wrong file. This is the metal body, which has thinner walls, uh, which helps with cost and uh, weight. So this was printed in nylon. It looks rough. It's really not. It, it's not that bad. But on the aluminum, and those look like layer lines, I bet with a bit of just a quick sanding, that would come right out. Same with the aluminum. It it almost looks like it has layer lines, but it it doesn't. Those aren't those aren't so much layers as um, as soon as you go over it with some sandpaper, it smoothed everything out. And what I did was I smooth, I only sanded in one direction because I wanted it to look in the end like brushed aluminum. So every time I sanded or did any sort of treatment, I always made sure I moved in the same direction every single time. So I always would end up with um, a similar grain. And just for reference, what I used on this was I put, I sanded it down Cleaned it with soap and water because I didn't want any finger oils on it. And then I put uh, nitrile gloves on to go paint it and painted it with a uh, truck bed liner, the same that is used by a lot of other folks on the proton packs. Truck bed liner, uh, oh, I forgot. I, I put latex uh, masking fluid on the edges where I wanted the paint to be chipped off later. Then I painted it with the truck bed liner. And that was that was a good move because I think it left a bit of a texture, which again a little bit of sanding after. So I would peel up the latex, and once I had that peeled up, I did some sanding just to really make sure that I got everything. And that left the bare metal. It still left a bit of a texture, and because of the thickness of the bed liner. You, it really does look like the paint has chipped uh, where it's been worn away. So that's the difference. That's the difference up close between rub and buff and actual paint that has been removed. And now I understand the whole toothpaste trick. The reason why you would you would use some sort of masking, then paint the 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 chipped paint looks more believable uh, when you do it like that. I think what I wanna do first is make sure that everything works. And to do that, I am going to, let's see, we'll do a firing test at level five. So it should overheat any second now. Okay, so it looks like the dial works. Yep, perfect. And from the front, there's your animation sequence. All right, we're looking pretty good. And this, I, it looks like a mess. I will, I will clean a good bit of this up as I tuck everything in here. But what I want to do next is I want to get the wire, uh, the wire kit uh, worked in here. Everything connected to this that needs to be connected. And one of the things that will be connected is this uh, strain relief boot. And this was designed so the wires will exit and go right between the toggle switches. That's why it was placed inset a little bit from the side. It also allows uh, this nut to attach. And so that gives me clearance on the inside. And yeah, that's, I think that's about it. And then once we get, once we get the wiring attached, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how to wire this up 
and I'm gonna make this my uh, test rig dummy plug. So I will keep this side attached to the test kit, and that way, anytime I want to test my setup with this, all I have to do is disconnect from my real pack, plug this in, and now I have a working attenuator that I can use with the test rig. And I think that'll be the easiest, the easiest way forward. All right, we're gonna move on to the next phase. And uh, this is the part that I know is going to be a bit of a pain because always is. And that is making the wire that will connect the attenuator to the pack. So what I have here is a jacketed four conductor. So I've got four wires inside of here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna feed it through some nice braided loom. And of course I now have yellow and black. Uh, when I first did my prototype, it was black only because I wasn't sure it was gonna work out. I really like the look and I think it's gonna look even better with a little more of a Ghostbusters yellow black flare especially with the new movie seeming to add a bit more yellow to the pack. So we're gonna make this work. And just FYI, the way this will work is when you sort of squish it together, it expands. Just like those little Chinese finger trap puzzle toy things. So we are going to feed that through, feed the wire through the loom. But first I want to cut off the right length. Now I've already measured out the wire. I've used about four and a half feet is what I went with. And the reason why I did that is there should be a few inches that you'll need on each end, about, a, about two inches or so on the uh, connector end because there's not gonna be a lot of room in here. Uh, it's basically going to plug, it's going to solder into some sockets right in here. And then we're going to run it all the way down. And we'll have a few inches, basically the length of the attenuator. And then we'll crimp on some connectors at the other end. So I am going to do a clean cut on this. And we're going to melt because this is nylon. All right, so just want to melt that down a little bit. And we'll put this away before it entirely unravels from the cut, the freshly cut end. I'm going to begin feeding this in and for the most part, it's going to slide through. There will be a point where we'll have too much friction and we'll have to start pushing it and sort of inchworming it down. Push, push, expand, and then feed it through. Push, expand, feed it through. Push, expand, feed it through. And just keep following that pattern until we get all the way down. And just do it in little bite-sized chunks. Feed it down, feed it down until we pop out the other end. And there we go. Now we have our jacketed braid. This is and this is the part where I would suggest getting the end cap on. And to do that, we will push through. There's a little rubber bit on the inside. And this will, this will be a lot easier to feed through without that rubber bit at the end. There we go. So now we're coming right through. And we also want to feed through the rest of the boot, but don't secure it yet. This may be the easier way if you just sort of spin it instead of pushing it through. There we go. We pop right through. Now, what'll happen on this end, when you tighten this down, it will grip on. Yeah. 
And if we wait until the end, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some heat shrink tubing on this and that'll sort of take the place of this little rubber gasket because this is a bit of a pain to put on. But if we put some uh, heat shrink tubing, that'll keep everything tight. And then when we push this up over and then secure this down, it will clamp down these little fingers at the end will clamp down on the heat shrink tubing and that'll keep everything nice and tight at the top. So I'm just doing this loosely and we're gonna work on this end. But first, let's take a look at, let's take a look at the other end of this thing. There we go. All right, this is a very, very tiny screw. I suggest putting it someplace you're not gonna lose it. I've got a little silicone mat right here. And once you have that removed, should be possible to split this apart. There we go. I think it's a, that's right, it's a twist. Twist and pull. So there's a, let's see if we can find, yeah. See that little, that little indentation. So you're not gonna be able to pull it straight out. There's a little divot inside. It's a little divot right there. So the screw keeps it in place, but the divot is gonna keep you from pulling it straight out. All right. So this is the part that is a pain. We need to get the wire into these little marks, into these little uh, tabs but we also need to limit the amount of wire that's going through because we don't want too much. And we also need to, we need to make sure that it will fit into this clamp on the other side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the clamp off And just like the other screw, I'm gonna set this aside in a place that should hopefully not get bumped or cause me to lose the part. Now we're open on the backside. This wire actually came with heat shrink tubing, but I don't need all of this. I need about half of this. So I'm gonna cut this piece in half. Nice, neat little piece here. That'll just about do it. I may actually need to trim more off, but I'm gonna put the factory flat end towards the outside and we are going to push that over the loom. So now we've got the wire, the loom, and then our heat shrink tubing, which we'll deal with later. What I wanna do now is I wanna peel back this outer jacket. And to do that, we're going to nip carefully. So if you've not done this before, Basically, I'm just sort of scraping. I don't want to go too deep because I don't want to cut the wires underneath. But if I sort of score the plastic and work my way around, you can kind of feel for where the uh, black jacket on the wire sort of gives. And this is where a pair of uh, sprue cutters is actually better than a set of uh, bigger wire cutters. Eventually what you will notice is as, as you continue to nip through, you'll start to see the wire underneath. There we go, see, we got the wire underneath. And hopefully, if you did this correctly, you won't have cut into this wire. Now it's covered in a bit of a uh, powder that just keeps everything moving inside of here. So as the wire twists, these actually glide a little bit. All right. So what we will do at this point is I'm going to repeat this process again, but now for each individual wire. And what I'm gonna to try to do is I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna strip the wire. 
where you just sort of grab just lightly enough that you can pull the jacket off of the wire, but not cut the wire. Now this is a skill that not everyone has and can be a bit of a learning curve, but I assure you it's a, it's a good skill to have. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna twist each one of these and I'm gonna twist it tight. I mean tight. I want, you'll see why in a second. I need as many of the strands as possible because I want the utmost uh, connection into this thing. Almost had a wire strand from another wire. So make sure that you were twisting only the current wire. We're right. gonna go to, make sure you got all the strands together and just twist tight. So pinch it and twist it around. All right, so now we've got four strands all twisted out. Nothing's crossed, everything's isolated. All right, so now that we've done that, let's go ahead and do the other side because if we screw this up, we wanna screw it up now, not later after we've got everything mostly assembled. And like I said, we, we're gonna push this, we're gonna push some of this um, nylon braiding down. We want a good bit on the other end here. It's okay to have extra. You'd rather have a little extra here to work with and coil the wires up than to not have enough. Remember, as soon as you start to see wire underneath, you've done enough. And then just do a quick check and make sure that there is no, that you didn't damage the sheathing on any of these because the last thing you want is damage to the underlying wire. And these all look clean, so there we go. That is, that is one of the harder parts is just making sure you've stripped back both ends and prepped everything for attachment before um, going any further. Because if we screwed up the wire, we'll throw this out and we'll try again. But thankfully, that's all, that's all we needed to do. So I forgot one thing that is very crucial, and that is before we, before we actually put the heat shrink tubing on, what we should do is feed everything through the housing. There we go. All right, this is the important part. Make sure this goes on first because this is gonna slide down over everything else. Then we put the heat shrink tubing on. So that's my mistake. All right, so there's your order of operations. So we've got the wire inside the loom, the heat shrink tubing on top, and then the rest of the connector. Okay. And we're going to push those down and out of the way because we want to work on this end only. Okay. So now we need this little, this little piece. And what I found works best is take a small flat headed screwdriver. And what we want to do is sort of get up underneath these tabs and carefully carefully bend it out just a little bit. So I just sort of get up under underneath them and just bend them forward, sort of opening them up. Now at this point, I need to point out that there are numbers on these. So on the front, there's a one, two, three and four, so they are numbered. Uh, these are at least easy to see. One is this top one, then two, then three, then four. 
since I've already done this, I'm gonna use the same pattern because this is gonna match up with the attenuator uh, connector that is already in my pack. So the four pin aviation connector, I used one for ground, two for five volt, which will be red. Three is TX, that's white. That'll go to the PAX RX. And then four is RX uh, yellow. That'll go to the PAX TX. So now that we know the numbers and the colors, now for the fun part, and that is matching these up. So pin number one is this one right here, and that's going to be black for ground. So what I suggest is feeding the wire through, and once you push it through the hole, just bend it back so it doesn't move. So the main thing we'll do is we'll follow the color pattern, and black will be ground, pin one, red is positive for five volts, that goes in, that goes to pin two, I've just realized the problem. I want to roll up and die. I might as well explain this on camera. So the problem is what I want to do is I want this as tight as possible when it comes in here. And I can't do that because the wires are very set in their configuration. All right, I'm going to try and correct this. All right. So now we're ready to attach this plug end to our wires. But before we do that, we need to make sure we have the right orientation. And so we have plugs one, two, three, four. They need to be in a certain order in order to fit as snugly as possible into um, up against this end. To do that, we're gonna have to have some of the wires cross over now I could have done this one of two ways. One, I could have used the other end of the cable which has the right orientation of black, red, white, yellow. But we should be able to get away with swapping the red and the yellow right here. I'm basically gonna fold them over so that they're on opposite quadrants. So now let's try this again. We're gonna push pin number one, which is on this side of the divider up top. It needs to be twisted a little more. All right, so what you wanna do is feed them through, but don't pull it tight yet. Just bend the wires down after you feed them through, you may have to give them an extra twist. But if you don't bend the wires over, they're going to come right back out. And there we go. All right, so white is three. And lastly, yellow should be four. Yep. All right. So there, everything's anchored. Now for the fun part, we need to push the wires down. Basically, now we need to pull them tight. And we wanna make sure, actually what I may need to do is cut back a little bit more of the black sheathing just a tiny bit. All right, and as we do this, what we can do is start to press those tabs down. So after we bent them out to feed the wires through, we can sort of push them back into place. And some of that will happen automatically as we pull these wires tight. The idea is, let's see if I can get this to focus. All right, we'll try. I wanna make sure that the jacket of each wire goes to its respective port, at least as much as possible. I don't want any of the wires to touch or cross 
below that little junction point. So you see the white, yellow looks pretty good, red looks okay, black is fine. Okay. All right, so the next step is we're gonna fire up the soldering iron once again, and we're going to solder these in place. And once that's done, we can start buttoning this up. Okay, so the next step we said is we're going to solder these in place. This shouldn't take too much, but uh, I think what I'm gonna do is, let me grab my helping hands, just so I can make sure everything's in an orientation that makes sense. Really solder those suckers on there. Now remember, if you apply too much heat, you could potentially damage the connector, so use only what you need if at all possible, and try to touch the wire, not the connector. And that should, that should deliver enough heat to melt the solder into that socket. All right, one more. Now we can trim the excess. So we got this end done. Let's go ahead and cut back some of the wire on the other side, and we'll kind of do the same thing. We'll just leave plenty of plenty of wire for our needs. It's probably going to be way more than enough, but having some extra some extra wire makes it easier to grip and twist. If the wire is too short, sometimes it's hard to get all of the strands together. All right, next what we're gonna do is one more check that I like to do before I close everything up, and that is continuity. All right, so I've got my wires. And I've got my connector on this end. What I'm gonna do is grab the multimeter and we're gonna make sure everything is correct. This is always a good investment and a good sanity check. So digital multimeter, set it to continuity. It's just gonna emit, emit a tone. And what we wanna do is check. So pin one should be black. We also wanna test the others because we wanna make sure we have not crossed the streams. And there's red and pin two. Next should be three, which is white. And even though we've tested them all, I like to double check. All right, so yellow is four, and we have no crossover with the others, so we're good. So now I'm confident we can start buttoning this up. And to do that, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push the sheathing down a little bit. So I'm gonna pull from the other end of the wire just get a little bit of slack and push this down. And I wanna make sure it comes all the way down to that point there, right at the end. And what I'm going to do now is we're going to cover this with the heat shrink tubing. Heat shrink tubing should cover two problems. One, it's going to shrink down over the end and keep this from fraying. It's also going to cover our connection points so that nothing, not that it should, but nothing comes in contact with this metal. So there we go. And to do this, I'm gonna use the small heat shrink, uh, sh heat shrink tubing. Oh. Heat shrink tubing, I'm going to use the small heat gun. All right, that looks good. That came down pretty good. Looks like it was maybe a two to one heat shrink. Yeah, still warm. But you can see it's a little nubby where we have our solder joints, but that's fine. 
So I still wouldn't trust this with a lot of uh, force, at least not until we put the end on it. So now what we'll do is push this up onto our wire. And remember this needs to go in the back, that little, that little L-shaped channel. You'll see the divot on the back of this connector. Push that in there and twist. And then you'll know that it's good. All right, what I'm looking for is there should be a hole in there that's lined up now. And that is lined up for that tiny little screw, which last time I did this, I lost it. Okay. All right, so now the socket is firmly ensconced inside of the connector. And there we go, we did this just right. The heat shrink tubing doesn't show, but it will still give us something to bite onto with the other side of this clamp. So we will place the clamp over the wire. I think what I'll do is I'll set, I'll set the screws out for now. So now that I've got it lined up, I'm gonna reinsert the screws and begin threading them into the other side of the clamp. Okay. So the clamp is on. Now we just need to tighten this thing down. Now I pointed out in the other video I did that this is the same type of aviation connector that it appears uh, HasLab may be using for their ghost traps. So now you know how this goes together. My suggestion, and I'm going to do this when I get my trap, is I'm going to take a look. I may take off this back clamp and just double check that everything is firmly seated. because this, this is clamped down pretty damn tight. And depending on how much those uh, ghost traps are gonna weigh, that could be a lot of weight that is coming down to this little clamp, making sure that it's holding the wires tight so they don't pull out of those uh, solder sockets. So there we go. We have now made our connector end to the pack. Nice and tight. And let's go ahead and do one more check just to make sure we didn't pinch anything. All right, so this pin one should be black. Pin two should be red, pin three should be white, and pin four is yellow. Good. This side's done. All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm just squeezing out any excess because we had pushed some slack onto this. I just wanna make sure that we have pulled all the slack for this uh, sheathing down the length of the wire and I just push the other end off. All right, I think at this point what we need to do is we need to put the heat shrink tubing on. All right, so the end of the wire is right here. All right, so I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use the heat gun again on this. All right, that's enough. All right, so I made a small mistake. I had accidentally pushed this off the end of the wiring, which caused a problem with me trying to reverse it. Um, basically, 
you want to slide from the other way. So from the plug end, slide this on. The wire is down inside. I've got just enough heat shrink tubing so that the fingers uh, on this on this plug on this strain boot will grab hold securely. So I'm going to do that now, and we're going to twist this on. And there we go. And I just lined up the strain relief nut with the hex top. So now the next phase, we're going to connect this into the attenuator. So I'm gonna, I had set this up to test it. I'm gonna pull, pull my connectors out. So I've got connectors for the serial data connection and power. All right, there we go. So this is removed. Now, now for the fun part or at least the somewhat easier part. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna feed all the wires through the bottom hole. And we're gonna feed the plastic nut with the open flattest side. So this is rounded. We want the flattest side towards, towards the metal shell. And I'm a perfectionist, so I'm going to put the labeling that says PG7 on the uh, downside so you won't see it. In other words, it's facing me right now. But you won't see it once it is secured. And what I'm trying to do is turn this. Trying to orient it so that this is flat on the inside because I don't want it to interfere. I don't want it to interfere when I put the uh, back panel on it. And there we go. We have just assembled this. So now we've got our cable. What good is a cable if we don't have a socket? And oh, we actually have to connect everything inside. So let's, uh, let's do that real quick. All right, so to do this, remember I put some JST XH connectors inside the pack. We're going to make sure we connect up and use JST XH connectors. I used to absolutely hate these things, but I've kind of grown to not only learn how to crimp them correctly, but I kind of don't mind them now. All right, so I've got, I'm gonna need two of these. All right, so these are your JST XH connectors. These are the larger ones. The reason why I went larger is because this is thicker gauge wire. If I had thinner gauge, this would have worked fine for JST PH, the smaller ones. But we need big. We have bigger wires to deal with, so we need a bigger connector. And to do that, we have these little these little guys here. But we've got too much wire, so we're going to need to cut these off. And all you need is like two millimeters, an eighth of an inch, or so. That's it. That's all you need at the end, because what you're going to do is these are going to get crimped on and you are going to have, you're going to have that little bit there, those two wings, those are going to grab the jacket of the wire. And then there's two prongs just inside, which are going to grip the bare metal. Okay. I flipped the camera or zoomed the camera a little bit so you might be able to see this better. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set 
I'm going to set the wire into the crimp connector. And I'm just going to squeeze it a little bit. I want you to see, see the outer edge, the outer wings grab the jacket of the wire while the inner wings will grab the bare wire itself. That's the important, that's the important part because you want this to grab onto the jacket. Now, how do we crimp these? Crimp tool. So these typically fit, there's three sizes. Basically these will fit just fine in the middle. But what I found works best is there's actually specific grooves. If you look in here, you see those little grooves? That's the part that's going to take the wings on each side and curve them in so they grab on. So they're actually gonna curl like this. They don't just fold over. They're gonna grab like that. They're gonna be folded inward. So what we need to be sure to do is make sure that for that grooved section that the wings face the grooves. So I'm gonna twist this wire around and I'm gonna position it so that just the very tip sticks out. And the reason why I did that is I don't wanna crush that part. That's got a little tab. So you're gonna squeeze it and then when you squeeze it all the way, it's going to automatically release the ratchet but you see, I don't wanna crush that end because that's when you push that into the socket, that's what actually grabs the pin. And if you barely see it, there's a, little, there's a little spring clip that sits up. That's what grabs inside of these sockets and keeps it from pulling out of the socket. So when you crimp, wings go towards the grooved portion of your crimp tool So wings towards the groove and don't put the, don't insert into the crimp tool any further than that little wing tab thing. And then squeeze and then you're done. Now sometimes it doesn't pinch all the way. So you may have to use some pliers and sort of squeeze the side to round these things back out a little bit. And the reason why we do that is because otherwise these may be too wide to fit into the socket. All right, so with the ends crimped, now we can insert into the socket. And this is the important part where things have to be the correct uh, polarity, the correct orientation for it to work. Now on this little, this little breakout board I had made, if you align this part, the tab, and look at how it fits into the socket, the way I oriented this, looking at it from my perspective, positives on the left, uh, negatives on the right. So I have inserted those into their socket, and now I can push the socket into, or push the plug into the socket. And then it's just a matter of getting the wires to fit into, oh, you know what, we're gonna remove this. And we'll try this again. I'm going to run it up and between the toggle switches then plug it in. There we go. All right, so now we should have the power, uh, have the power connection done. Next, we need to do the data connection. And I think with this, by the way, I had done some cable management in here. I've mostly got everything tucked away. 
the only thing I haven't quite done yet is I need to, in fact, I can probably do that now. I'm going to take the adhesive back off of the tiny little uh, vibration motor, and I'm going to stick that to the side of the casing because that is what's going to provide the most amount of feedback is when it's directly connected to the metal or to the to the shell. All right. And this is my little break so my little breakout board is in here. I put some tape on the back just cuz I don't want those bare uh, positive and negative power connections touching anything metal even though it's painted. Uh, I don't want there to be a contact. So I've got this got this in place. And let's see what else. Ah, yep. All right, so that's in there. And I think what'll what'll happen is when this is in its final final resting place, um, the ESP controller is actually going to be right up against the shell. And I'm going to kind of use the shell as a, a heat sink. So you'll you'll be able to see one of the status lights through here. And I think that actually it'll look pretty cool once it's all once it's all fired up and running. The uh, serial connection's done, so I need two more of these uh, pin connectors. And we will be doing this again for the inside of the pack, but for now, uh, we're just focused on getting this done here. All right, so I've got my two pins, my two connectors, and we're going to do the same thing. Remember the big wings on the outside, on the back edge, they wrap around the jacket of the wire. And then Wings face the curved inside portion of the crimp tool. Then squeeze, release, and we're good. That actually looks looks pretty darn good. This does take some practice. I, I hated it at first. I've kind of gotten used to it. I've crimped so many wires now. All right, and then again, outside the big wings wrap around the jacket. And you can always double check and make sure that the jacket ends and then you have the, the tiny clips. Make sure those only wrap around the wire and you're good. This one I push the tab out. Sometimes it's necessary, just use your fingernails and bend the tabs in just a little bit. They don't have to completely overlap or cross, but they may need to uh, bend inward just a bit, just to grab the, grab the jacket of the wire. Okay. This one crimped a little wide. I just want to squeeze it. Okay, now for the part. Okay, so if we look at this, uh, what did we say? There was three is supposed to be the transmit, so TX, because that goes to the pack RX. And we'll have to remember that when we do the other side of this. But for now, white is TX, yellow is RX for receive. All right, so white is TX. And on this connector, TX for me is going to be on the left side of this connector. So white is TX and yellow is RX. This is what happens when it doesn't crimp, uh, crimp compactly. It gets stuck. And sometimes you need a T-pin. This is uh, one of the most useful tools besides a, a paper, clip, paper clip in IT. 
what I'm doing is using this to push the wire into its seat. All right, there, it's in there. Okay, so looking at the key jack, the key for the jack, TX, which we said was white, yes? Yeah, TX is white. TX is white, that goes on that side. And all I need to do now is let's do, let's do the same thing. Let's run this up between the toggles and we may run underneath some of our other wires and we'll run up under this is wire management. All right, I'm gonna run it around the back side of the encoder. All right, looks like we're solid. Uh, what I've done is I've ran it up between the toggles. I ran it under the wires for the for the uh, rotary dial, rotary encoder. And the reason why I did that is the way the wires will sit now, it will be, uh, it will help hold the uh, controller down uh, into that groove. All right. So let's just do, let's just button this up for the moment. We'll just put two screws in here real quick. And I can't seem to thread it because I'm not lined up. How about that? All right. All right. I'm just going to put two screws in here. Keep this closed. Just makes it easier to move around on the workbench. All right. So I've got those. So that's it. That is that is nearly done. We've done probably the hardest parts. And you can see a little bit of the controller right there, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah, so. Yeah. All right, so that gets us the, sorry, I realize I have some comfort words when I'm chatting. Uh, all right, we're gonna set that off to the side and now we just need to do this little guy. And I think the easiest way to handle this is we're going to use some of these, these connectors. So these, um, may have covered these briefly. Buy these from Amazon. Uh, you can get them relatively easily in bulk. I ordered like 20 of these, or a pack of 20. I'm gonna need soldering iron and we're gonna fire that up so while that is warming up I'm gonna prepare these all right so the socket side of this thing is also relatively simple there are numbers on each of the pins which should correspond to what we just uh, connected on our side. Now on the other side, pin one was, if you're looking at the socket, it was up and to the right. If you're looking at this, the pin, pin one is up and to the left. So basically they do meet up. So one was negative. One was negative and two was positive. Hmm. 
And it looks like I stripped off a little too much wire there, so we will nip these. These need maybe three, four millimeters. Now, these are already the correct orientation for most of the plugs on the controller. Um, we tried to get the orientation to be consistent in the most recent design, and that is putting positive on the left. So now for the uh, now for the pain, and that's let's see if maybe we can alleviate that pain by using the helping hands. So what I'm going to need to do here is solder in, and the easiest way to do this is to hold it with the. Hold it with the hands. Okay. All right, so I'm going for pin number one. <sighs> yeah, this is the one that I hate doing. All right, uh, what I'm essentially trying to do here, if I haven't screwed this up, is I'm sort of filling each one of these pins with a reservoir of solder. And then what I'm doing is touching to melt the solder. All right, that's two. So that gives us power, one and two. Next, we need to do the data lines. This time I'm not going to strip off more than is needed. But I do need to figure out how to orient this. So we said that white three is going to go to RX. So if we look at how this fits into the socket, uh, you can't see it, but I can tell you RX is on the left, so that's red. And I apologize that we only have the two colors, so that means three is going to be red. So I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to use the soldered connector that we already have to help hold everything in place. And like I said before, I'm going to try to fill these little these little sockets with a bit of solder. And let's try this again. Yep. And then once we've re-melted the old solder, I just place the wire into the pool of molten solder and let it harden and we're good. All right, let's see if that did it. Um, what we'll do is we'll connect our power connection and we'll add our data connection. All right, now for the moment of truth, since we have essentially finished the attenuator, we are going to plug this in. And we don't have to secure it down. Let's get uh, power plugged in. We'll see what happens. Okay, we've got power. That works. And we've got data. And there we go, we have a working attenuator, and if we press and hold, see we've got a blinking red light now, so you know you're in the second menu. 
And there we go, we are working. Yep. So wand firing, power level five. If I turn it down, there we go, see? Everything behaving as expected. And if you notice, change to green. So now you know a device is connected when it goes green, but if it's blinking, that's, effect, that's uh, reflecting the uh, menu level. And then menu level one, we go solid. And let's tr give this a shot. Let's do, let's fire. Yep. There we go, we canceled. Yep, still firing, it's active, warning. Yep, there we go. So it looks like we are good. Everything's working exactly as anticipated. Let's go, let it go into overheat. This is, this is pretty satisfying, feeling the, uh, the metal and the vibration. Yeah, I'm happy. And I like the new uh, yellow and black braided cable versus the plain black one I used before. All right, we have successfully finished this attenuator. So I appreciate you sticking with me through all of this. And thank you for your time. See you later.